Welcome to Game Hacking 210. In this video, we'll cover how to update broken scripts in Cheat Engine and how to make them more resilient to game patches and updates. As always, this video builds from all the previous videos in the GHS series. So if at any point in this video you get confused or lost, I highly suggest you go back and catch any videos you might have missed. But alright, to showcase this, we're in Jedi Fallen Order. But keep in mind the techniques covered throughout this video will work in a ton of other games as well. So let's take a look at the script that used to work before the latest Jedi Fallen Order game update. And what the script is supposed to be doing is taking damage, which is an XMM6, and dividing the damage done to the player by an amount we specify in an address control from the address list, while damage dealt to enemies is multiplied by an amount specified in this address in the address list. But if you watched our last video until the very end, you'll know that the script now crashes the game. And to see why, let's head to the address our script is hooking for the code injection. And yeah, the memory address this script is supposed to be hooking kinda no longer exists. And this highlights an issue with Cheat Engine's code injection template, which, for better or worse, is the one we've been using so far in the series. It uses a code address directly to target the code the script will manipulate, which is all fine and good until a game update comes along and changes the code addresses. So to fix the script, we need to find the new code address of these original instructions. And while we could just repeat the same steps from Game Hacking 207, Another, often faster way to do this is to look inside the original script under the Disable section and check for a line that looks like this. Note that this line gets generated automatically with any of the injection templates, so unless someone deleted it in the script that you may be trying to update, you should see it here. And within this line are the bytes of the original instruction, the MoveSS XMM1 RBX plus 1BC. So, assuming that the instruction hasn't been changed during the update, we can come over to the Cheat Engine Scanner and run a scan for these bytes to try to find the new code address where we can inject all our code. And to scan for the bytes, let's set the value type as array of byte, which sets the scan type automatically to the only type for the array of byte value type, which is search for this array. And keep in mind that bytes are hex digits, so double check that this hex option has a check mark right here. Now, if you're not sure what an array is, for our purposes here, just think of an array of bytes as a pattern or sequence of bytes in a particular order. And one last thing we need to do before we run the scan is make a quick change to this writable option. And while memory protection is beyond the scope of this video, just know that game data, which are things like health, mana, ammo, and player coordinates, are normally stored in writable memory, while the bytes for code are usually stored separately in unwritable memory. Which means if we leave this option checked, we'll only find addresses of data and not the addresses of code. Which is the exact opposite of what we want to do right now. So by clicking inside the square once, the check mark gets removed and Cheat Engine will now scan only memory that isn't writable, meaning we'll only scan through the memory of code. Now, if for some reason you want to scan for both writable and unwritable memory, you can click inside the square again to get this small box inside. But I'll just click two more times to remove the check marks so we only scan through unwritable memory, and now let's run the scan. And I get three results. And this means three different code addresses currently have the MoveSS XMM1 RBX plus 1BC instruction. And now we just gotta figure out which of these contains the intended game mechanics, which in our script involves health and damage. And let's just start with the top one. I'll simply right click it and then hit disassemble this memory region so we can take a look at it in the disassembler. And because the original instruction is accessing an address, we can right click the instruction and find what addresses this instruction accesses and then unfreeze the game and see if the health addresses are being accessed. And okay, I just took damage, but the health address wasn't accessed, so we can safely assume that the move SS instruction at this address has nothing to do with health or damage. Let's repeat the same steps for the second result. And now we see what looks like the player health address, which we can verify by adding it to the address list, increasing the value, freezing it, and then taking a few hits in the game. And yep, health stays frozen in the game. So it looks like this is the correct new code address. But again, we can only use the address accessing method because our instruction has an address in it, which won't work if the original code we're scanning for doesn't contain an address. So if the script used this instruction as the injection location instead, we wouldn't be able to use this option because no addresses are involved. So we'll need a way to see the values inside the registers when the instruction runs. 
And to do that, make sure it's highlighted and then come up and hit debug, then toggle breakpoint. And we see the instruction highlighted in a different color, indicating that the breakpoint is active. And now I can just unpause the game with Cheat Engine and the next time this instruction tries to run, this breakpoint gets triggered and Cheat Engine freezes the game exactly at this instruction. So the game is literally stalled right here and isn't running any of the code that comes after it. And because it ran all of the code above this instruction and then stopped execution as soon as it reached it, we can see the values inside the registers at the very moment just before this instruction executes. And to reveal the contents of the XMM registers, we can just click this right angle bracket and make sure we see XMM registers listed here and the correct value type here. And health and damage are both float values in Jedi Fallen Order, so we're good to go. And if we look at the XMM1 register, we see the value of current health, which makes sense because the player just took a hit in the game. And we know XMM1 received a copy of current health from RBX plus 1BC here. And then in XMM6, we see this value, which is damage. And again, these are the values just before the instruction actually gets run. And immediately after the instruction runs, XMM1 will hold the result of XMM1 minus XMM6. And if we come up here and click this step into option once, the game is going to run this one instruction and then stop at the next one. So when this happens, we should be able to see XMM1's value change to the result of the subtraction. And there we go. XMM1 is now holding the new health value after damage has been applied. Now the health address hasn't changed yet because the instruction writing the new health value back to the health address hasn't yet been allowed to run. But if I unfreeze the health value and hit run, Cheat Engine will now let the game run as usual until the next time it hits the instruction highlighted. And now we see that the health address does get the value that was in XMM1. So with these tools, we've determined that the middle result is the correct address. But just blindly going through and debugging these one at a time isn't exactly the best way to do this. What if our scan yielded 50 results instead of 3, and the correct address wasn't at the top of the list? We'd end up spending a lot of time debugging the wrong results before we made our way to the right ones. But with more information, we can actually do this a lot more quickly. Let's take a look at a screenshot of the disassembler view for each result, and compare them with a screenshot of the disassembler view of the address that held the code the script injected at before the game was updated. Notice that the instructions surrounding the MoveSS XMM1 RBX plus 1BC from before the update are completely different for these two results. But look at how similar the surrounding code is for the middle result that we just verified as the new correct address. So if we compare the original block of code with the surrounding code of each new result, we can simply take a quick glance at the disassembler view for each result and rule out the ones that don't have similar code and then spend time debugging the addresses in the blocks of code that resemble the block of code from the original block first, which can save us a lot of valuable time in the situations where the surrounding code doesn't change much between game updates. Now to finish updating the script, all we need to do is update the old code address with the new one. But this would mean we'd need to update the script every time the game gets an update. And I don't know about you, but that sounds incredibly annoying to me. <laughs> So instead, let's change a few things in the script to try to make it survive as many future game updates as possible. And the first thing we'll change is how the script finds the right code address to inject at. We've already been able to narrow down thousands of code addresses to just three by using the bytes of just the MoveSS XMM1 RBX plus 1BC instruction. And since, as we just saw, the surrounding code is unique at this particular address, we can add more of these bytes to narrow down the results list further to only the correct new code address. And if I come before the first byte of the AOB I already have in the scanner and add in 7, 4, and 1, 7, which are the bytes of the instruction immediately before the MoveSS instruction in the disassembler, then run a new scan, we can now see that there's only one result. But the found address ends in .exe plus 6828.45, while the address of the MoveSS instruction ends in .exe plus 6828.47. And that's because the first byte of the array I scanned for is this 74, which is the address ending in .exe plus 6828.45, and Cheat Engine returns the address of the first byte in the scanned array in the found list. So if I delete the 74 and 17 at the beginning of the array, and instead come to the end and add the bytes of the instruction just below the move SS, and then run another new scan, this time we get the correct address as the only result. And now that we have a unique AOB that finds our code address, we can use it inside our script with a cheat engine function called AOB scan. And to get this function to work for us, we'll need to enter a name and our array of bytes. 
So now, when the script is activated, it'll scan every byte of memory in the game starting from the very first byte allocated to it. And once it comes to the first pattern of bytes that matches the array of bytes we entered, it'll give the address of the first byte of that array the name Read Health. And since we know this exact sequence of bytes is found only at Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order.exe plus 682847, this F3, which is the first byte of the AOB we scanned for, will get the name Read Health in our script. And because of this, we can now replace every iteration of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order with Read Health. And with that done, once I activate the script after a few seconds delay, we see that the correct instruction was modified. And we can follow the jump and confirm that we do indeed see all the assembly code from our script right here. Now, with what we've done so far, as long as you have Cheat Engine version 7.3 or higher, the script will disable just fine. But if you're using any version below 7.3, your script will not activate unless you come back in and register the name you assigned in the AOB scan. And speaking of the disable section, the script is currently restoring the original code by using the mnemonic or text version of the opcode. But Cheat Engine will sometimes reassemble an instruction we type into a different instruction that will effectively give us the same result. And the issue here is that when that happens, the bytes of the original opcode won't be the same. And if the bytes that are restored aren't what they were originally, it can throw off the specific pattern of bytes we're scanning for to find the correct code address. Meaning that once we disable the script, we may not be able to re-enable it. So to guarantee that the exact bytes that need to be here are restored properly when we disable the script, we can use the declare byte command and specify the bytes to restore, which are the ones we replace when we activate the script in the first place. And all right, you may have noticed there's a delay with the activation of the script. And that's because the script is now scanning all the game memory to find the AOB we just entered, which is a whole lot of memory to scan through. But since Jedi Fallen Order has module addresses, we can use the AOB scan module function, which works almost the same as the normal AOB scan function, except that we add the specific module of memory we want to scan between our name and our array of bytes. And now the script activates much more quickly because it's not scanning all the memory for our AOB. It's just scanning the memory in Jedi Fallen Order.exe. Now, if you don't see a module name in the code addresses, you can come up and click View and make sure that Show Module Addresses is selected. If it is, and you still don't see a module name, the game is likely not using module addresses and unfortunately you won't be able to use the AOB Scan Module function. But alright, now we have a script that looks a lot more like one generated from the AOB injection template, which will still ask for the code address you want to inject at, but then ask for a symbol name. And whatever you enter here will be the name chosen in the AOB scan or AOB scan module function, which by the way will be chosen for you based on whether or not Cheat Engine detects that modules are in use. And for the symbol name to be valid, you need to make sure it has the following syntax. Note that if your name doesn't meet this criteria, your script will not work correctly. And also, as of Cheat Engine version 7.4, the name you choose gets registered as a symbol, which is global to Cheat Engine, so when making scripts using the AOB injection template, be sure to type a unique symbol name here for each script you make so they don't interfere with each other. And alright, once you click OK, Cheat Engine generates a script with the basic setup that is very similar to the one we've been working on. And it even generates an automatic snapshot of the surrounding code for us. But while Cheat Engine does a solid job of generating unique AOBs a lot of the time, note that it can sometimes fail to find a unique AOB automatically, and in that case you'll need to manually create one like we just did. But even when successful, the template doesn't really make an effort to use an array of bytes that won't break our scripts in the future. To see what I mean, let's head back to the script we've been working on and let's again compare the code for our injection location before and after the game was updated. While the instructions are mostly the same, notice that a few bytes change with the update. Which means, if I had used an AOB scan with the original bytes, the script would still fail to find the new code address because I have this sequence of bytes listed in the AOB scan. And if it happened before, it will likely happen again. So we need to account for the fact that this byte in particular is likely to change in future game updates. And to do that, we can change it to two question marks which Cheat Engine will interpret as a wildcard. And now, this byte can be any value as long as the rest of these bytes match in the sequence. And if we scan to verify that, we see that we still only have one result, so this AOB is still valid. So that's one issue solved, but if any of these other bytes were to change in the future, the script will still fail to find the correct new code address. Now we can't put wildcards for every byte, because then every pattern of bytes in memory would match. But there are bytes in certain opcodes that are more likely to change than others. 
And our goal here is to minimize the risk of the script breaking by only keeping the specific bytes that are least likely to change and using wildcards for all the rest. Now, being really precise with this method takes really good knowledge of the x86 assembly language, but I'm gonna assume that most people watching this video aren't assembly experts. So, a general sort of blanket statement is to keep only the first byte of each instruction and use wildcards for all the rest. Again, this method isn't guaranteed as even the first bytes of opcodes can change, but this will definitely lower the risk of a broken script in a lot of cases. Also note that with this method, your AOBs will very likely need to be longer because with all these wildcards, a lot more AOBs can match this pattern. And there's really no point in ending an AOB with a wildcard, so I'll add the F3, which is the next byte from the disassembler, and then check for unique result. And yeah, we have a lot more matching addresses now. So, following the pattern of bytes in the disassembler for the next instruction, let's add three more wildcards for the bytes after the F3, and then the first byte of the next instruction after that, which is 4.8. And this gives us a lot less results, but we want just one. So, instead of adding more bytes at the end, which we can certainly do, I'll instead come to the beginning of the AOB, and I'll add the first byte of the JE here, and use a wildcard for the second one. And now we're down to two results. So let's throw the array we just scanned for into the script, activate it, and see what happens. And as you might expect, our jump now starts at the JE instruction because that's the first byte in the AOB scan. But we have a second code address that matches this pattern. And what I want to point out is that if we look at this address in the disassembler, it doesn't get affected by the script. And that's because the AOB scan functions stop at the first address they come to that matches the pattern of bytes, and they ignore every address after it. And because of that, we can use this array in our script without any issues. But our jump is starting where we didn't intend it to originally, so we'll need to adapt our script to handle this. One way is to redirect the jump to start at the moveSS instruction. This byte is the one currently getting the name read health. And right here in our script, we're telling Cheat Engine to go to read health, which is this byte. And then starting at that byte, replace the bytes there with the bytes for these instructions. Well, if we want to replace the byte starting at this one instead, we can just count in hex how many bytes forward this one is from the one with the name read health. So this is read health plus zero, this is read health plus one, and this is read health plus two. So if I add plus two to our read health declaration, we can now see that the JE instruction wasn't affected. Instead, the instructions jump new mem and the three knops, which are represented by this knop three, start at the second byte forward from the seven four. And before we disable the script, we also need a plus two for this read health as well. Or if we actually do want to inject the JE instruction, we can remove the plus twos, add the JE command under original code, change the knob three to knob five because the jump will take up these five bytes now, and now we'll have five bytes left over in the move SS instruction instead of three. And then we just add the seven four and one seven at the beginning of the bytes we want restored. So either way, we now have a working script. But right now, when we disable the script, we're restoring the bytes by listing them directly. But if these bytes change in a future update, we'll be restoring the incorrect bytes which will change the original instructions in the game. So instead of hard coding the restored bytes, let's use another handy function to read whichever 10 bytes are here before they get changed to the jump to our injected code, and save them so we can then restore whatever those bytes are when we disable the script. And this cheat engine function is called readMem which takes an address and a number of bytes to read starting at that address. But of course, we don't want to use the actual address since that is very likely to change in the future. So instead, I'll use read health, which again gets assigned to that address in the AOB scan. And now we need somewhere to store the 10 bytes. And as always, when we want to store values somewhere, we use addresses. And to do this, we simply use the alloc function as we've been doing throughout the series. And I'm allocating 10 bytes since that's the number of bytes we'll be storing. And then we do our normal declaration above newmem, but this time we place our readmem function. And now when we enable the script, Cheat Engine will go to the read health address, which again is currently associated with .exe plus 6828485 now, we'll copy the 10 bytes from there, and then paste those 10 bytes into the store bytes address before it changes the original bytes to jump newmem. And under disable, we'll read health as being declared, we'll use readmem again, but we'll read the 10 bytes inside our allocated store bytes address, copy those 10 bytes, and then write those bytes back into read health. 
But just like before, you'll need to register your allocated address as a symbol so the name will be recognized in the disable section, which will allow you to disable your scripts. And now, as we can see, the script still properly enables and disables. But all right, this script isn't quite done being updated just yet because I'm still using the original instructions inside the script. And the whole reason we're using readmem to save and restore the original bytes is because we assume that at some point the bytes of the original instructions may change in the future. And if they do change, that means that these hard-coded instructions that we have in the script may also change. And again, some higher level assembly knowledge is required to know exactly which instructions are more likely to change than others. But here are some general guidelines for this. Any instructions involving addresses are more likely to change between game sessions or updates. Now, just like with using wildcards for the bytes in an AOB scan, we'll need to hard code some instructions to get the impact on game mechanics we're looking for. So let's separate these instructions based on how likely they are to change. And the good news is that the kind of instructions we typically manipulate to modify the game mechanics are in the less likely to change categories. So let's bring our focus to dealing with these other kinds of instructions. And like usual, Cheat Engine comes through for us with a function to deal with this, reassemble, which takes just one parameter, the address of the first byte of the instruction we want reassembled, which in my case is the first byte of .exe plus 6828485, or read health. That's it. The reassemble function automatically detects the number of bytes needed to reassemble the instruction. So now this will get us the same instruction as the JE instruction we currently see. And then once I enable the script and follow the jump, we see that the correct instruction has been reassembled below the moveSS instruction because that's where it is in the script. Now if I move it above, it gets moved to just above the other JE instruction. And if we take a look at the original code block from before the game update back in Game Hacking 207, we see that the JE leads to Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order.exe plus 70947DE but now the jump is supposed to go to .exe plus 68285e after the new update. And the hard-coded JE instruction in the script won't update to the correct new address destination, but the reassemble command will because it takes whatever instruction that's here and puts that into our injected code. So I'll comment out the hard-coded JE instruction and put it behind the reassemble one so I have an idea of what kind of instruction this is supposed to be if I come back to the script in the future. And all right, one last thing about reassemble. If we copy and paste it as it is now, then re-enable the script, we get an identical copy as expected. But if we wanted to reassemble the MoveSS instruction, we can just add the number of bytes between the first byte of read health, which again is the 7-4, and then add two to get the first byte of the next instruction. And now we see a duplicate of MoveSS XMM1 RBX plus 1BC. Just keep in mind that you need to type in the hex number here so for example, if we wanted to see the XOR instruction, which is 10 bytes away, we would need to use plus A here. And by the way, this works exactly the same for read mem. But all right, this script should now survive quite a few game updates. And hopefully we won't need to stop any further progress in the series to fix a broken script. So in our next video, we'll get back to our original goal of expanding it with a lot more options. And of course, we'll be dealing with some new challenges along the way. So be sure to subscribe to Guided Hacking and hit the bell so you don't miss any future videos. And as always, thanks for watching. See you next time.